The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I, that's Jesus speaking, I have came, or I have come that they might have life and they might have life abundantly. John 10.10, 10, dear fellow redeemed, think about all that you are because of Jesus. Think about all that you are now because of what Christ has done for you. You have been chosen by God. You didn't choose Christ. He chose you, as the scriptures share with us. He adopts you into his family. God declares you righteous. That is, not guilty of the sins that you have committed because of Jesus Christ. You have perfect standing with God the Father Almighty, with now a freedom and a boldness unimaginable, right? You can enter into the presence of God. You can speak with him because the barrier that separates a sinful person from a holy God has been removed again by Jesus. When you look at verses 19 through 21, you have an explanation of what's been talked about throughout chapters 8, 9, and 10 of the book of Hebrews. And then in verses 22 through 25, you have an invitation. The penman is saying, or shall I say, the Holy Spirit is saying in the book of Hebrews, come to God. Draw to him. Speak to him. We are in The final days, the day, the last day is fast approaching. So instead of falling away from God, instead of drifting away from God, instead of moving apart from him, draw near. Hold fast. Confess the truth. Give a testimony of the faith that you have that the Holy Spirit has generated in your heart and your life is lived in now. You and I are encouraged to learn from the examples of many Christians that have gone before us. We're encouraged to not just learn from their examples, to walk in their examples, and to become that example to other people. To stir up, stimulate, or provoke love and good works in other people. Through our words and through our examples, we look to encourage. We look to be encouraging people. What are we looking to encourage? Faithfulness. Faithfulness to the Lord our God. Edification in our Savior and what he's done for us. We gather together in the name of Christ. The first readers of the book of Hebrews were not gathering together anymore. They were drifting away from each other. They were struggling because of the persecution. So they needed this encouragement. So do we. I invite your attention to Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, which he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So far, the verbally inspired words of our God here, God speaks to us himself through his verbally inspired words. Therefore, we prepare to give these truths our undivided attention with that in mind, so we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. It's like the theme of Hebrews, right? This must have been shocking to the original readers. I mean, there's so many points throughout Hebrews that you could say that. You could say that what is being said would be like, are you serious? Like that goes against what I think and what I've been taught to learn. This is another one of those points. It had to have been shocking because there's this phrase in verse 19, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary. What is the sanctuary? The original readers of this knew the sanctuary. They're talking about the holy of holies. Not just the holy place, but the holy of holies. 
And they're being told that they can enter into the Holy of Holies, that is the presence of God, boldly and with assurance. Well, this goes against everything that they'd learned. Imagine for yourself here, well, let's, let's have some fun with this one. Imagine you just beam down from the Starship Enterprise, and you see this massive gathering of people around a tented structure. The tented structure is large, and it has a courtyard created with a tented fence, and you see people dressed very interestingly and very apart from the other people, and they're entering the tented structure, and they're going inside. And then you see smoke rising from the tents. So you go up to somebody, and you ask, well, what's going on here? And they say, well, that's a tabernacle of the Lord. The tabernacle of the Lord is the dwelling place of the holy, just, powerful God among his people, which is us. And then you, you point you know, to the priests. You're like, what's the deal with those guys? And you're like, well, they're priests. They're set apart to offer sacrifices to God, but also to be go-betweens God and us. They talk to God. They say what God has to say to us. We say what we've got to say to God. Through them, they represent us to God. You point to the structure, because it's very unusual. You're not seeing this in the desert. You point to this structure, and you say, what's the deal with that? And they say, well, right there in the tented structure, the front part of it is the Holy of Holies. In there is this, this candle, you know, this beautiful candle that, that gives light, and the candles are trimmed by the priest, and it signifies the light of God in a dark world. And over on the other side, there's this table of showbread, and the table of showbread has manna because manna shows us that God sustains us. And there's an altar of incense, and the incense is burned, and it signifies prayers, prayers of God's people rising to the presence of God, filling the room. And you're like, cool. And then they say, and you know what? There's this thick curtain that separates another kind of corridor, the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant sits, this fantastic, fantastic thing that has the two cherubims on it and the mercy seat in between, the rod of Aaron, the Ten Commandments that God wrote on himself, and a jar with man are there. And the, the priest sits on the mercy seat, and God's presence dwells in there, the awesome God that's created all that there is. And you say, this sounds amazing. I would very much like to go into the presence of God. The person looks at you and says, are you kidding? You can't. I can't even go in there. Only the high priest can go into that holy of holies once a year. In fact, the other priests, they can enter the holy place, but I can't go into the holy place. I'm not a priest. I'm not a Levi. I don't have the qualifications. Now you're sad about this because you would very much like to enter the presence of the holy, powerful, loving God that has delivered his people time and time again. And so now you and I are being told that we can freely enter the presence of God. Not just enter the presence of God. We can do so boldly. In other words, every single Jewish person, every single Gentile person can enter into the presence of God. God wants them to come. God wants you to come. The barrier has been removed. What an unspeakable privilege that is ours now because of Jesus Christ. Oh, we enter God on God's terms. And God's terms are that we enter his presence through Christ. Anywhere you are, you can pray and speak and enter in the presence of God because what God has done for you. In the military, right? In the military, they talk about if a, if a superior officer is there, you cannot speak freely with them unless you ask for permission to speak freely, and then you do so. They say yes, and then you can. God has given us permission to speak freely to him because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has paid for us. Jesus brings complete satisfaction to the payment of our sins. All of this, as what's been talked about throughout the book of Hebrews, is this is the shadow. The substances of this is found in Christ. So Jesus died for our sins, and now we live differently. We live a new way of living to God. We have passed through the veil that separates us. Christ has torn it apart. He's opened the way. Jesus is our high priest. We are his church. You are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. 
John the Baptist points to Jesus. Remember this, John 1, 29. He points to Jesus and he says, There, or behold, is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So whereas sinful people do not just simply walk into the presence of God, because of the blood of Christ, we can draw near and we can enter into the presence of God. So we are encouraged to draw near with our heart cleansed and our conscience cleansed because Jesus has removed our sin. He's removed the guilt of our sin and he's purified us, enabling us now to come into his presence. And isn't it our conscience that's, that, that, that just is bugging us a lot? Isn't it your conscience when you, you start thinking things through, starts pointing out your failures and your faults and reminding you, you're not really that good. I mean, come on, I was there when you said it. I was there when you did it. You're not so wonderful. Your conscience reminds you over and over again that you need help and the help can't come from inside. The help has to come from outside and so it has. It has in Jesus Christ. He gives you a new heart. So listen again how this is said. Let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Your assurance in the faith, your assurance of the love that God has for you is the reason for your hope. You can look forward with hope because of Christ. Now, when, when you think of the Jewish people, and, and, and as we read about them in the scriptures, it seems, and this is not overly correct, by the way, but it can seem that there are people that's always looking back. They're in a present situation, and they're called to, you're struggling now, well, look back. Look back at how God delivered Abraham. Look back at how God used Moses to deliver the people and make a nation. Look back to God working in the life of David, especially when King Saul was saving him. Look back and see God working in the lives of his people. That's true. You can do that. You should do that. But there's so much more. Look forward. Look forward in Christ. Look forward to the promises that Christ has for you because God always keeps his promises. Look forward to the day when the Lord will bring you into his presence, when the Lord will come again and usher uh, you know, new heavens and new earth. Look forward with joy to the working of the Lord in your life. Yes, we can look back, but we certainly should be looking forward. And so now what that means is you're a hope-filled person. Because your hope rests in God. God is faithful. In fact, we're told in the book of Hebrews, we're told God is faithful. God keeps his promises. God has written his name on your heart. God has written his law on your heart. You can now do what's pleasing to him because of Christ, the faith that you have. God will remember your sins no more. You sinned, gone, gone in Christ. Nobody can bring that up. Nobody can use that against you because it's gone in Christ. God will not leave you. God will not forsake you. This doesn't mean that you will lie in bed all day then hoping in God. Because he's going to remove my sins. He's going to take care of me. I'm just going to lay in bed here. Watch things on the phone. No. When you read the Bible, hoping in God doesn't lay around. You're called to action. Your call to action. Remember, life in Christ is often depicted as walking, moving. Faith is growing. Faith is robust. It leads to actions. It leads to fruits of faith. And so you're either growing closer to the Lord or you are shrinking away from him, but you are not going to be neutral. So you're going to lay in bed all day. Rather, you hope in God, and that hope produces action. It produces visible effects, fruits of faith. One of the visible effects is found right there. Look at verse 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. This is a good one. The word stir up could be translated stimulate or provoke. It means focus on each other. Take the focus off yourself and put it on others. But do so in a loving, Christ-exalting, God-pleasing way. Your aim is to love others in Christ. You want to speak and act in a way that will help move them 
closer to the Savior, Jesus, that will help stimulate in them a love for Christ and a love for others. Think of it this way. If a group of teenage boys are getting together and they go into a room and they lock the door, your probably first thought is this. They're stirring up some trouble. And you're probably right. A good question for a group of Christians is when a group of Christians come together, we should be stirring up love. We should be stirring up love. We should be so motivated to pay close attention to each other in a good, God-pleasing way that we are stirring up and encouraging love for each other. Now, this is not simply the passage that says, let's have warm, fuzzy feelings for each other. That's not what this is talking about. It's more than that. It's acknowledging what is right and God-pleasing in action. And the thing about this is, is God has blessed everybody with unique and varying gifts to that person. You have some gifts I don't have. I have some gifts you don't have. Other people have other gifts you don't have. And yet God uses them in beautiful concert together for the good of his kingdom and the good of his people. So well done is always better than well said. Both really should be the way our words and actions should be, stirring each other up to love. Let's linger on this encouragement for a minute, though. Let's just linger here. It seems so easy when people get together to really find fault with everything, find fault with other people, find reasons to be angry and upset and negative, and it's all going downhill, and that can easily dominate. Now, there is a place for correction and admonition and exhorting each other. There is a place for that, absolutely. But let's not get so short-sighted that we forget to encourage each other. Sometimes the best way to remove a chip on the shoulder is a pat on a person's back. Now, in tennis, uh, there's, there's the line judge. Typically, to be a line judge, you need to know the game. In tennis, you have to have a, a good reputation among players and among officials. You're somebody that doesn't get too bent out of shape, doesn't have a personal grudge with the players. And so you sit on the line and you call out faults. The ball goes out of bounds. It's a fault. It seems in life there's a lot of people that think they've earned the right to look at your life and call out your faults. Maybe they're even correct. But have they earned that right? Oh, yes, again, we want to admonish each other, but we need encouragement. We need encouragement the same way that crops need the rain. In fact, continue on. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, it's interesting. It's, it's most sermons you'll read, most devotions you'll encounter that pick up verse 25 almost carry a theme of don't stop coming to church. I mean, it is true. That is a proper application of 1025. I've probably preached on it myself the same way. I don't know. I don't want to look back. I'll just move forward. But from the context, what you have here is Christians not just not going to church. They weren't getting together. They weren't coming together and encouraging each other at all. So there was not coming to worship, not good, but there was not even getting together with their like-minded fellow believers to encourage. They were isolating themselves. Oh, that's never good. That never works well. And so they were encouraged to have the habit of regularly coming together and using every opportunity that the Lord put in front of them to strengthen each other. Don't get in the habit of cutting yourself off. Now, I know you can say it. You can say, yeah, I don't want to get up Sunday morning and make the drive. I can probably find a better sermon on the Internet. Guess what? I write these sermons. You probably could. Or I can hear people say, we're just so busy. We have so much going on. I don't deny that people are busy. But that's so upside down. When you think of how Christianity, how the Bible talks of the desires in our heart, our desire is not to look for a reason not to come to church. It actually is we look for reasons to come together. Yes, to be edified by the word. Yes, to praise God, to worship him. Yes, because the Holy Spirit works in worship, but also to encourage each other. 
We want to encourage each other. The trials and the hardships that we experience by the grace of God draw us closer to the word, draw us closer to the Savior, and draw us closer together as we encourage each other and carry one another's burdens. And that's why this, this appears some 70 times in the New Testament. This phrase appears some 70 times, which is consider one another. Consider each other. How am I going to build each other up? Now, I want to end on this point here. I think it's good. I've used it, this example, a couple different ways in a few different sermons because, again, it's so striking. In the book Four Loves, written by Christian author C.S. Lewis, he talks about his circle of friends. He had this real close, intimate circle of friends. Okay? In the circle of friends, three of the main people were Jack, Ronald, and Charles. Right? Now, Charles died which is awful, but he was a believer, so C.S. Lewis rejoiced in that. But he said, as awful as it is that his friend Charles died, he thought, well, I'm going to get more of Ronald now. Because there'll be no Charles there. So he would you know, get more of him, learn more of him, experience life more. But he learned something profound and, and kind of sad, that in the death of Charles, he lost a part of Ronald that only Charles could bring out. So he said, in the death of him... Instead of getting more of his friend, he actually got less of his friend. Because only Charles could affect him in such a way that brought out these certain characteristics that he couldn't do. So he writes, quote, If this is true of human beings, if no one human being can bring out all of another person, but it takes a whole circle of human beings, community, to extract the real you, how much more is true of Jesus Christ? And so his overriding point is God gives gifts to all of us. God works wonderfully for all of us. And we can show each other aspects and some of the beauties of God that I couldn't see on my own. I need you to show me that. I need you to share that to me. And you need the others to share those things with you. That's how great our God is. He's too big to be held by any one person. Yet he reveals himself to his word, and he uses his people to encourage each other. And so he uses us. So when we come together, we build each other up in that magnificent, saving God. Let us continue to encourage each other to do such a thing. In Jesus' name, amen.